Blog Talk Radio. Om Shabbat Shalom, Holy Way of the Most High. Om Shabbat Shalom, I sense your presence. Om Shabbat Shalom, Holy Way of the Most High. Om Shabbat Shalom, I sense your presence. And I am the light within your soul In the essence of truth and right Love makes the circle whole And here we stand in line Waiting for some sacred sign But to find the balance is the purpose of this time to restore the balance of the universal mind And in the presence of my Lord of light and love Everything I see aspiring to be free And when I call to thee And come on bending knee Surrender to the all-pervading light and love Reflections of the one surrounding me with love And I sense your presence I sense your presence I sense your presence I sense your presence Within and without, above and below, yeah. East, west, north, and south, I sense your presence. Without and within, below and above, yeah, yeah. East, west, north, and south, I sense your presence. I sense your presence. Shabbat 
shines on Holy angel of the most high Om Shabbat Shalom I sense your presence I sense your presence Thank you so much for joining me here tonight on Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour. My name is Jesse Ann Nichols-George, and I am your hostess tonight. The music you were just listening to at the beginning of the show is I Sense Your Presence by Shem Shai. And I just want to extend a welcome to everybody here tonight, whether you're returning or whether you're just joining us here for the first time. And I just had some interesting information come through on our chat area from one of our other hosts, Kevin Baird, and he was letting me know that Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour is showing up in the top three under live show searches under uh, spirituality. So that's really exciting. We were just actually given a uh, featured spot here on Blog Talk Radio. They contacted us and let us know we are now going to be a featured show. So we're very excited to see the growth. We've come a very long way here in the last year and a half that the show, um, not just this show, but that Main Street Universe has been on the air. So I just wanted to share that great news tonight. And here um, with my work, I focus on helping people find and use compassion in their everyday lives. I've created the Genesis Clearing Statement, which some of you have experienced in previous shows. And you can always go back to the archives and catch um, those shows that have the, the Genesis Clearing Statement in it, where I'm working with that. I've also authored two books, which are titled Activating Compassion and Activating Compassion, the Workbook. In addition, I have created the Compassion Tour, which is a multi-state nationwide tour, including workshops, retreats, seminars, book signings, and fundraising events. I'm already working on that 2013 tour, so pretty soon we're going to start seeing some venues pop up that you'll be able to register for. And you can stay on top of those venues at jessieannicholsgeorge.eventbrite.com. There's also an option there called gifting the tour. So those of you that maybe can't make it to an event, but you still want to come in and and help me get to some of those fundraising events, since 90% of what I make on the fundraising events does actually go to the organization. So it always helps to to have a little help getting out to those. Now, here at Activating Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour, what I'm doing is looking at different ways that compassion exists in our lives. So I look at how to remove our blocks, our resistances, frustrations, things like that. And some weeks I'm discussing different aspects of how compassion is in our life and how it affects our life. And the different areas of compassion, and then some weeks I'm doing more exercises and meditations and using the Genesis Clearing Statement and how to practically implement um, compassion into our lives. And then a lot of times I also have guests on the show, and that way you can learn about their work and how other things complement compassion and, and how compassion fits into other things that are out there. So uh, lots of exciting things that are happening here on these shows and I just want to um, you know help you remember that when you're sharing your experiences that you're also helping other people that are dealing with the same or similar issues so um, most people have things going on in their life so when you're asking questions then it, it's also helping other people with things that they're going through or maybe somebody they know is going through it and on tonight's show I have Penny Cohen And we're going to be focusing on how to get, develop, and keep relationships that are aligned with our spiritual natures and experience emotional, spiritual, and sexual intimacy. So you can call in on our live lines at 760-542-4345. And that will, if you press 1, get you into my caller queue on my switchboard. And you'll be able to ask questions to either Penny or myself as we're going along. Also, you can type those into chat. So the the chat area there, um, just type them in, and I'm going to keep an eye on that as well if you have any questions. And just a reminder that if you enjoy the show tonight, make certain that you tell your friends, family, and significant others. Let your Facebook connections know, and anybody else that you feel inspired to share it with, you can like it also. Um, We have those options right there on the screen for you. 
and uh, easy ways to share it there. So that's a great way to go. And uh, also those friends and family, if they want to catch it or other people you know want to catch it in the archives, they're just going to use the same link that you use to come into this show. And another option is they can go to my Activating Compassion Facebook page, which is at facebook.com forward slash Activating Compassion forward slash notes. And I keep all of the archived shows there, so it's really easy to go in and see the descriptions and everything and find a show that you like and that you want to listen to. Now, before I get started tonight, uh, what I want to do and, and what I like to do is I like to bring in some insight from Yehuda Berg. And I really love Yehuda's work, as I've said in the past, because it's very down-to-earth. It's very everyday human, basic people kind of terms. And I, what I do here is I randomly open to a page in the book. And this is the book, The 72 Names of God. And I like to use this book a lot when I'm just kind of trying to get some insights or I'm looking for a little bit of focus on things that I'm dealing with in my life. And what I do is just randomly open to a page, and it's always got a message, and it seems like it's always appropriate to whatever we're dealing with and going through. So I like to do this every week so we have a little message here for the week. And let's see what we've got coming up for us tonight from Yehuda. And tonight I've got spiritual cleansing. And it says here, we all come into this world with spiritual defects that need correcting. These imperfections have accrued over previous lifetimes, and we cannot rid ourselves of their negative influences until they are mended. And he goes on to say in his thoughts, sometimes we lack the emotional courage and spiritual strength to correct all of our flaws. What's more, our egos use many devious tactics against our own best interest. One of the most potent of these tactics is cynicism, the sense that anything but chaos should not even be thought about by an intelligent human being. This is a convenient escape from doing the hard work of spiritual transformation. It allows us to see ourselves as eternally blameless victims rather than as responsible beings who are thoroughly accountable for the state of our own lives. There are two ways to cleanse in life, pain or proactive spiritual transformation. The path of pain hurts the body, our health, our finances, our personal lives. When we experience sickness or poor health, if we lose a business or grow broke, if a marriage breaks up, or if there is heartache from children, this is all considered spiritual cleansing. The path of proactive spiritual transformation only hurts the ego. This name focuses upon the ego, thus allowing us to purify and repair past iniquities in a merciful manner. Now, the meditation that Yehuda has here is By meditating on these letters, you push rewind and erase on your spiritual video. You are purified in your present life by correcting your transgressions from your life in the past. This name also cleanses our physical environment from spiritual impurities. So I think that this is so important to what we're dealing with tonight. And we may not always think about that with relationships, but... With relationships, so many times they're there to help us get through things that are within ourselves, as well as a lot of times we need to go through these spiritual cleansings, for example, having relationships that maybe don't work out as well, in order to get to a place where we're ready to have that that relationship that is going to last for us. Now, the name of the spiritual cleansing is Mem Vav Mem, So Mem Vav Mem is the name. And again, just focusing on being able to cleanse everything through and to let go of those transgressions and remembering that you've got a choice. You've got a choice to learn it the hard way through pain or you've got a choice to do it proactively and uh, to do proactive spiritual transformation. So 
There we go. There's Yehuda Berg's message for tonight. And for those that are just kind of jumping into the show, you can always go back and catch the first part of that. And moving on here, our topic and our theme tonight is love and relationships. And and love, relationships, soulmates, lovers, and more. Is there just one soulmate? Is there truly just the one? And how do we know when this will happen? Where we'll meet or or what to do? And for so many relationships, the, in that area of life, that even the most composed people can become a hot mess. Okay, So for so many people, what happens is they might be really composed in most areas of their life, but when it comes to relationships, they can even fall apart there. And the toughest guys can melt, and the most timid women can find strength within them. Confident women can become insecure, controlling, catty, and obsessive. Macho men can become possessive, uncertain, and desire to make certain that others know what women, what woman is theirs. Now, love can shift us in so many directions. Many feel that they cannot live without having a partner in their life. There's a desire to rush it and to feel that it is, has to happen by a certain time in our life, right? We talk about that biological clock ticking. And there's even a lot of cultures and belief systems now that if people aren't married and having kids by like 23 years old or 25 years old or even younger than that, that it's like their life is over. So it's a, it's a very different thought pattern in a lot of different areas. There's a lot of confusion of when love isn't working for us. And our desperation can lead us into relationships that don't satisfy us, which I think is an important thing to keep in mind because then we're not really being compassionate with ourselves and we're not necessarily being compassionate with others when we do that. For many, there's a concept that relationships should be easy and never need work. There's the idea that our partner knows everything about us without communicating, and expectations that they know our every need and desire without us telling them, as if they are expected to be psychic. Why do we place so much of an unreasonable concept on something that is so valuable to us? What really blocks us from finding real love? What does love really mean? And how do we know when the person we are with feels the same about us. The path of wanting, finding, discovering, and maintaining a love relationship requires a tremendous amount of compassion. It is a process of realizing that we need to be able to focus on a partner's true needs and not just our wants. It is about both giving and receiving. It is about seeing what is really happening instead of jumping to conclusions or making judgments and accusations. I'm going to take a short break, and when we return, I'm going to have Penny Cohen on to help us understand some of these dynamics and talk with us about how to have the relationship that you truly desire. And the song that I've got for you for this break is called Deliverance. It's by Shem Shai, and some of you have remembered that I've met Shem Shai in the Arizona region, and they're now traveling all over the world, and they've been kind enough to let me use their music throughout my show here. So we have Deliverance, and again, when we come back, Penny Cohen will be with us. Living in light, devotion, number one. word for every living one. Be the light reflection of the sun. I see your face. The every living wonder of eternal Every 
Welcome back. You are listening to Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour. My name is Jesse Ann Nichols-George, and I'm your hostess this evening. You were just listening to Deliverance by Shem Shai. And if you missed the first part of our show by chance, you can always go back and catch that in the archives. And uh, just to remind those that are coming in, Certainly feel free to share this show with those uh, friends, family, Facebook connections, anybody else you want. Make sure you click like on it. Thanks to all of your support. We are growing here on Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour. I've seen a 25% increase in our listener base since last September, and we are now listed as a featured network here as Main Street Universe. And uh, recently was just informed tonight by Kevin, one of our other hosts on the network, 
that I was showing up as number three on the front page. So we're very, very excited about the progression that we've got going on here and all the new hosts that we have coming in. Now, I would like to bring on my guest tonight, and the person I have with me here is Penny Cohen. Penny is a LCSW, Transformation Psychotherapist, Relationship Expert, Career Coach, Speaker, and Author. For over 25 years, Penny has been counseling, lecturing, and speaking on personal development, relationships, career, and spirituality. She is the author of Personal Kabbalah, and her private practice is located in Westchester, New York. She helps couples not just love each other, but be in love. And we're going to focus tonight on how to get, develop, and keep relationships that are aligned with our spiritual natures and how to experience emotional, spiritual, and sexual intimacy. If you'd like to find out more about Penny's work, you can look her up. She has uh, got a website which is located at www.pennycohen.com. And I'm going to type that into our chat here so that the people can see it, what I'm saying here, www.pennycohen.com. And that's also listed at the bottom of our show description as well. So that will make it really useful for you. And let me go ahead and open up Penny's mic here. Penny, thank you so much for being on Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Well, I really appreciate having you here, and I know you're on the East Coast there, so it's a little bit late for you, but we do have a lot of East Coast listeners, so um, they're they're hanging in there with you. <laughs> I, I want to um, just remind people that if you have any questions along the way for Penny, you can always call in on our switchboard, and that number is 760-542-4345. I'm also going to be watching the chat area to see if we have any questions that go in there as well. So either way, when you, t- when you call in on the phone lines, just press 1, and um, that will get you in, and it will pop a little question up, and I know you've got a question for either Penny or myself. And, yes, Kevin's coming in from the Midwest region out there in the Illinois area, and I'm out on the West Coast, so we're kind of covering coast-to-coast here <laughs> tonight. Hey, Penny, um, what I would like to do is to kind of just get started by having you share with our listeners uh, about what led you to get into the, to the work that you're doing and kind of like what your what your story is, what led you to here and now. Okay. <laughs> well, I guess it all started while going through divorce. Uh, I was 38 years old, and my husband told me he wanted out. I was a mother of two children, young, nine and five, and I had no career, no sense of myself, no education, college education anyway. I went from high school, living with my parents, working part-time as a secretary, and I was married at age 19. At age 38, my uh, 17 years into the marriage, my husband told me he wanted out. And I was devastated and went to a therapist who said to me at the first visit, the mind controls all. Yogis can walk on nails. They can regulate their body temperature. And the mind can work over matter. Well, I decided I was going to be happy instead of sad. And I also, um, my neighbor next door was divorced six months before, and she had suggested keeping a journal. She said it would be very interesting to see the changes that would take place in me. So I bought a pencil and pad and kept it with me at all times, and I was writing down all my thoughts and experiences and what was happening. I also decided to be thin for the singles world, so I lost 30 pounds in two weeks. And I want, yeah. (laughs) When I'm determined, I'm determined. (laughs) Um, 
And then I wanted to learn everything I could about relationships, so I stayed up all night long reading endlessly. And I took to sleeping maybe an hour or two a night. After a while, I went into a very high state of consciousness. I guess it was writing all my thoughts down. I was waking up in the middle of the night writing thoughts down. I realized the mind never stops. And I began experiencing ESP and mental telepathy. And one evening I woke up and it was like something was guiding my hand. And I wrote a theory on how to reach the highest in creativity. And then I guess I, I don't know time frame. However, I guess from overwhelm with exhaustion while dusting furniture one day, I just started crying hysterically. And I started running to my bedroom with these animalistic guttural sounds coming out of me. And my knees went down to the floor. My hands went over the bed. And I, I was an atheist at the time, but automatically screamed, God, help me. And then I lay down in the bed. And this incredible radiance and warmth literally surrounded my body like soft pins and needles massaging my skin. And then I felt this vibration enter into my body. And it was a warmth that I had never experienced before. And I remembered thinking, this is the feeling of love without having someone to love. This is unconditional, divine love. And then I heard a voice. And please don't think I'm nuts. I'll explain it or make sure I explain this. <laughs> and the voice said, you are a messiah. And I remembered screaming inside. A messiah can save the world. I can't even save myself. <laughs> <laughs> and then the voice said, oh, and then I remembered thinking, but a messiah knows all. What do I know? And the voice said, all knowing is within, and what you know will manifest in poetry. I chalked the whole thing off as a hallucination. I never wrote poetry. I never read poetry. In high school, it took me three hours to write three lines, and so that was it. I was sure it was a hallucination. Two weeks later, I was visiting my brother for the weekend, and I woke up in the middle of the night and wrote the first of about a thousand poems that came to me sporadically throughout the day and night. Now, after that experience, I, although I continued to write poems, I lost that high, clear state of experiencing ESP and mental telepathy. And I realized I reached a higher state of consciousness, but it happened in a very unhealthy way. I was probably very close to a nervous breakdown or death. And, um, but I started questioning, how can you reach this state in a healthy way and maintain it? Which goes along with your questioning for today. And over a 25-year period, I was literally guided to study um, uh, parapsychology, transactional analysis, Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, and finally Kabbalah. And even the Kabbalah came uh, uh, serendipitously where um, – I had studied all these traditions, and I had seen a workshop on Kabbalah that was given at a New Age Institute nearby, and 
My husband and I wanted to meet friends halfway, so we agreed to go. And when I walked into the workshop, I saw this diagram called the Tree of Life. It's a, the Kabbalistic Tree of Life, which is really the blueprint of the structure, function, and dynamics of the universe as well as depicting the journey of the soul in our relationship to spirituality, the divine. But when I saw this diagram, my body started to vibrate like it did when I had the mystical experience. And uh, at the end of the evening, the instructor said he was given a six-day workshop the following week, and I love synchronicity. I just happened to be on vacation with no plans, so of course I took the workshop. At the (laughs) end of the workshop, um, I decided to read every book given by the instructor, and I was giving workshops at the time locally at a local senior center, and I had just mentioned to these uh, participants that I had taken this workshop, and they said, well, why don't you teach a class on it? And I said, because I'm female, I'm not 40 years old, I'm not steeped in the Torah, I'm not married, and I don't meet the qualifications. However, after about three months of them literally badgering me, I came in one day and said, look, I'll be happy to facilitate a study group with the idea that I'm a student along with you, and any questions that come up, we'll research together. And I taught it that way for three years. Then there was a mystical conference locally, and I signed up for it while I was waiting online. This is where we get into the laws of attraction. Before the book, The Secret, um, I was talking to the rabbi who put the conference together, and she asked, what's your interest in Kabbalah? And I said, well, I had the mystical experience first. I came to it through the back door. Now I'm trying to understand what happened. So I understand it from a spiritual perspective, but not a traditional perspective. And she said, well, I know it from a traditional perspective. Why don't we teach a class together? And we taught that class for 24 weeks. People from that class asked me to do a study group, which is going on now for 11 years. And... um, While I was teaching, people started asking me to work with me privately, and I had no college degree, no credentials. So at age 48, I went to school for my social work degree, bachelor's and master's, and four years later, I started a practice, uh, a a psychotherapy practice. And um, while doing I also, by the way, during that time, remarried, went to school, and um, belonged to a a spiritual support group, people from all different denominations. And one day, every so often, I'd say, well, Kabbalistically, they view it this way. And one day, while walking out the door of one of the homes, this woman whispers in my ear, write me a proposal for a workbook on Kabbalah had never written before in my life. And I sat down and wrote a 60-page outline, and it was accepted. And the book, Personal Kabbalah, 32 Paths to Inner Peace and Life Purpose, was published in 2005. Since that time, of course, people have been um, teaching laws of attraction and what you think you attract, including relationships, of course. But I realized just thinking and attracting is not the end-all, be-all. It's who you are, how you relate in the world, and what you put forth to make a difference. And so I started teaching personal precepts on what it takes to really open up to love. I realized from that mystical experience that love is self-imposed. It comes to us and through us. It has nothing to do with another person. 
And it's up to us to open to that love. And when we're open to receiving that love, everybody around us is radiated in that love. And they experience it sometimes consciously, but more times than not unconsciously. And so my primary work is to help people be in that divine love. So that's how I came to this. And and that that is so important. And I think sometimes people get so wrapped up in the relationship that they've they've forgotten that real feeling of being with the divine love, and that it it starts with the self. It starts exactly. by radiating radiating that love outward, which is allowing you to be in that position of of receiving, as you mentioned, and. And this is kind of a foreign concept because it's funny, the the very thing that people are looking for is the very thing they're not having any contact with a lot of times. That's right. Exactly. It's a very switch around thinking. And I love how you've been through this huge journey of going from no belief system, basically, or, or not believing in a creative force, to finding your your niche in in spiritual development and finding what worked for you and this is something that I always stress with people that you know there's so many paths to the same place and absolutely you've got to find the one that meshes with you because our souls are in these different places and and we're in different development ranges of souls and and different paths work for different things lessons or whatever that we're working on and um so, so it's very exciting for me to hear you say that because this is this is a big thing. And I think, too, the other thing where you're coming in a little bit later in life because a lot of people, I think, associate a lot of this in love stuff and the relationship stuff with something that, that is for younger people. But we have such a huge generation now of people in their mid-60s that are just starting a life over. You know, they're just looking for, for people now. And, and they're wanting these relationships. And, and so we have this huge diversity. It's not just the young kids anymore. <laughs> right, Here. right, absolutely. Or you find the midlife crisis generation of people searching, is this all there is? And the answer is, yes, this is all there is, but it could be sublime if you make it sublime. As a matter of fact, I just put, um, a little post on on my Facebook the other day on instead of midlife crisis is usually looking for the excitement again, and instead of looking for another person for the excitement, look into yourself to find and fulfill your purpose, and you derive the excitement that way. And when two people are in that state living their purpose, they're constantly um, transmitting divine energy. And that's when there's that deep connection of being in love. And so the excitement comes from constantly asking what I call quality questions. And if you're always asking quality questions, you're always opening up to new information rather than another person for that excitement. And with the new information and the creativity flow, for me anyway, and I, this is what I teach, you literally feel tingles inside you. And as a matter of fact, when my husband left, he said to my ex-husband, he said to me, I love you, but I'm searching for those tingles. Mm-hmm. And I constantly asked, what are those tingles? What are people searching for? <laughs> you know, the excitement, the new person, the new aromas, new sex, you know. Sure, that's great. But I got to tell you, if you can open up to that creative flow and feel the excitement within yourself, other people feel it within you. And when you open to that excitement, that's when you attract somebody who's just as open because from a spiritual perspective, like attracts like. 
and and this this overlaps all areas of life um, for people. This isn't just relationships that this works in because when we're searching for that perfect job, for example, or that um, having a certain amount of money or driving a certain car or or these types of things, we're not actually going to find that happiness. Yes, it can be fun to jump in and drive that car and have that mansion and all of those things, but if you're not happy inside yourself, those things become empty very quickly. Absolutely. And, I... and, and the best form of being that magnet is to become it. And that's essentially what we're doing when we go inside ourselves is to to become what we're searching for. Right. I usually like to say to attract the right person, you have to be the right person. And the right person for what you're trying to attract. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So if you want somebody who's um, exciting, who's... Uh, understanding, affectionate, warm, loving, um, forgiving. These are the traits that you have to develop within yourself. And when you experience these traits, you vibrate at a certain frequency, and that's when you'll attract someone with those similar traits. Exactly. And and sometimes that means making changes in within and without um, for different things because there are people, if you're looking for somebody that's very refined and likes all kinds of culture and art and, and you know, nice events and things like that, then uh, you're not going to get them <laughs> by having 10,000 body piercings and <laughs> other things. And that's not to say body piercings are wrong and the other is right. It's just saying you've got to think about what you're attracting and and to to become that. Exactly. Now that that also being said in what you just said, people look for people who have similar interests, similar um um uh, lifestyle values I think are the most important thing. Like my husband and I now couldn't be more opposite. Even when I first met him, I was writing little poems, and and one of them was, let me see if I can find it here. Uh. And while you're finding that, I'm going to just pipe in here. If you have questions for Penny, you can call us on our call-in line of 760-542-4345. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour, and my name is Jesse Ann Nichols-George, and I'm interviewing Penny Cohen tonight, who specializes in relationships and not only having love, but being in love, and uh, so we're talking about those topics tonight. And are you still searching there, Penny? Or? Uh, no, I'm right here. And, Got it. You know, as I was continuing to write those little ditties, when I met him the first night and came home on the train, I started writing, and I wrote, we don't have the same interests. He likes fishing and golf. I like sailing and tennis. He likes <laughs> poker and football. I like dancing and shows. Why should I see him again? Because. <laughs> Now, what happened was there was some underlying thing that attracted us to each other and kept us and keeps us together. And in the state of that being in love. And there's a glue of love here. We couldn't be more opposite. I really mean that. People look <laughs> at us and say, how could you be together? But I have a lot of friends, couples, who do a lot of things together, but they don't have that same closeness that we have. And the closeness really comes with learning to bring in that energy and sense the energy, sense it. And and uh, what I work on with people and myself on a daily process because I believe enlightenment is not an end result. 
It's a daily practice of processing your thoughts, feelings, speech, and actions and to transform them to love. And when you do that daily practice, you're more open to that love. Now, my husband can come near me and say, boy, you're so close. I'm staying away from you. Or, (laughs) you know, we know what we can do even to help each other out. Now, the closeness that we talk about, like you mentioned, I like to teach people how to be in love. That's when you're in that totally open state without judgment, criticism, shame, or blame. And when two people are together in that state, their energies, their souls literally merge like Adam and Eve together before they were exiled from the Garden of Eden, together in pure oneness, before they were um, exiled into animal skin. And you literally feel like you're in the womb of divine love. And there's nothing better. That to me is pure bliss. And when two people can reach that state together, just like a two-year-old wanting to be with mommy and daddy and then running off and then coming back again, you're rejuvenated (laughs) constantly. And 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 I want to... I want to say in here, too, that, you know, we talk about, okay, finding people that are similar to ourselves um, or have similar interests or values, and I think values is is a key component because we do have that concept of opposites attract um, and, and differences there. But when we look at that, what we're talking about is there are some people who want somebody who's different from themselves because they want to learn of different things than what they already know. However, when it comes down to it, what brings them together, even though they're very different, is that they have core values that are the same in there. Absolutely. Now, uh, it's interesting when you say opposite to track. I had said from a spiritual perspective, like attracts like. From a psychological perspective, opposites usually attract. And what we're attracted to when you talk about uh, pure values or core values, um, I always use the metaphor of Eric Burns' transactional analysis. I don't know if you're familiar with that, where he talks about the three different levels, the parent, uh, child, and um, uh, parent, child, and adult. And it, it, we use the metaphor of two people, or it ego and super ego. He, he um, simplified Freud's theory. And we all have a parent, adult, and child within us. And if two people come together, one usually has one or two of these three states developed and the other has the opposite state that isn't developed. So like in my case with my first husband, he was an accountant, very logical, very rational. So his adult state was developed. I was more sometimes nurturing but also critical and also more emotional and at the same time playful. So I developed my parent and child state while he developed his adult state. And that's when two people become one in a very dependent, needy relationship where he felt responsible for my happiness and felt stuck. And I was looking, always looking for him for happiness. And ideally, we want to be able to develop all three states within reason and revolve where sometimes I'm nurturing him, sometimes he's nurturing me, sometimes we're playful together. And that's when we have much healthier relationships. That being said, if we do attract 
the opposite to attract. We're talking about this deeper level of the parent, adult, and child states, which would translate into thoughts, feelings, and actions. And um, if we can learn how to communicate with each other in a way where we support each other in developing these three states, we can still feel whole even though we attracted the opposite. And so one of the important things in relationships, I believe, is for people to become coaches for each other. And what I mean by that, in the 1970s, Morton Hunt, who was a researcher on marriage and relationships, said a healthy marriage is mutual psychotherapy. However, in the 70s, people were still doing psychotherapy by analyzing each other, and that's probably one of the worst things you can do. Well, and that analyzing crosses over, like with the work I do, for example, in being judgmental, and and that's the difference. There's a big difference between being a coach for somebody and being equal to your partner and saying, okay, right now, you're really stressed, you've got 10,000 things on your plate, let me help you out. Exactly. And it says, hey, why are you pulling away from me and being a jerk? And, uh, or, you know, men going, why are you being so emotional? <laughs> when, <laughs> I love that, right. And so we, we, on each side, have those phrases that we tend to use, which are very judgmental, instead of saying, what is happening and how can I support you in this? Exactly. Because I can't do the work for you and I can't fix it for you, obviously, but how do I support you in what you're going through? Exactly. And, and, and you don't want to get takes no listening state. skills. And, and I'm sorry, what? I said that takes listening skills. See, like Another me, one. I should be listening. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> listening and communication both. I think in there. Well, you know, you said a very important thing, like men complain that women are so emotional, and women complain that men are uh, uh, unemotionally available, un- emotionally unavailable. And what I have found is women are emotional, but not necessarily really in touch with their core feelings. So they act out a deeper emotion. And in other words, they may cry, they may scream more, and that's because they haven't processed the deeper feelings under their anger. So they're criticizing in their mates what they're not experiencing within themselves. Now, you mentioned the word judgment. I believe whatever we judge in another is something we haven't resolved in ourselves if we get a charge around it. An emotional charge is like the thermostat as to whether the other person is a reflection of us or not. And if we judge them, it means there's something we're not resolved within ourselves. And what I mean by that is um, my husband, before he retired, was a marketing man. And uh, um, an in-between man where he would put together a factory with a distributor. And one day he said to me, gee, we have this, um, you know, our conference this weekend, and I'm going to introduce the manufacturer to this distributor. And I got all riled up. I said, how could you do that? How could you trust them? They're not going to need you anymore. (laughs) Okay. And he very calmly said, you know, I trust people. He says, all they have to do is, excuse my French, screw me once, and I'll never work with them again. (laughs) And I really pride myself in practicing what I preach, so here I am judging him for being too trusting. And I started processing. If I'm judging him for being too trusting, what's my issue around trust? And I remembered my father saying, we lived in Brooklyn, he owned an auto body fender shop, and he said, you always have to watch your back, you can't trust anybody. 
So mm-hmm. I had an issue with trust. And when I worked on letting go of the emotional charge, I was no longer judging him. He put these people together, and it was great. It was fine. So we always want to look at whatever you're judging in yourself. I, I mean, in another is something you judge in yourself. Another it's time, what we need to work on, and one of the people in our chat room um, mentioned in here, this is referred to as reflections, and the statement is so true. And a lot of times what's happening is we have the same issue or the same thing to work on or the same lesson to work on, uh, we're just not recognizing it because we're coming at it from a different angle. And like you said, it's it's like women tend to say to men, you know, you're you're being so distant. You're not talking to me. You're, and and really, what's happening is there's a distance within themselves because they're looking outside of themselves. So they're looking for that fulfillment from the other person instead of going back within and going, okay, what is triggering me to feel this way or what is going on with that person that they are pulling away? Maybe there's something I need to be, be focusing on that's bigger than me um, instead of just judging them as not wanting to spend any time with me, for example. And and I find that when we get into these extremes, and, and I'm sure maybe you can uh, validate... Jesse, it's breaking up a little bit. Okay. So I find that, I find that when there's we get a, into these... There's a lot of static. There's a lot of static on your end? Yeah, but it's clearer now. Okay. Um, I, find that, I find that when we get into these judging spaces, and I find that when we are not delving, we're not working on inside of ourselves and we're looking outside of ourselves, that we are, are actually in a point of... Um, Gosh, I almost lost my train of thought there for a second. Um, we're we're at a point where you were saying I did, looking I just, outside of <laughs> yourself. <laughs> no, you were saying looking outside yourself instead yeah, of within yourself. regarding judgment. The more we go into this judgment, and the more we step into those extremes, whether it's emotional or distancing or whatever, and a lot of times we don't even realize we're in those extremes the more we're going to cause the other person to be in an extreme that's irritating us that triggered it in the first place. So, for example, if, if a woman is upset because her guy is not having the communication with her and he, she feels like he's distancing, she gets emotional, so she's hitting another extreme, and he distances even more because she's getting overly emotional. Exactly. Exactly. And... Uh, even on a deeper level, we, we literally pick up each other's energies and act them out. And and that's an important thing on a spiritual level there that you bring up because the more time we spend with somebody, the closer we have a an intimate connection, not only physically um, and emotionally, but we have that intuitively. Exactly. So we're very prone to feel what somebody's feeling, just like that mother-child bond. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's this, again, this is why one of the practices I teach, I imagine you do too, is daily meditation so that we stay in our own higher energy field connected with our higher self. And it, the more we stay connected, the less we'll pick up other people's energies. And that includes our mates, our spouses. So it's a constant staying in our own path, if you will, our own connection to the higher self. And that's more when we come from love, so we have more love to give rather than look to get from the other person. We we have so, to refill our own self in there on a exactly, daily basis. Exactly. And the other part that I work on with people is if you can't open to that divine love, it means there's something within you that's constricted. And you have to process that in order to open to the divine. 
And it means more than just meditating and reaching that state of peace because we're ruled by thoughts, self-defeating beliefs, feelings, repressed feelings, and actions. And we that's what I believe we have to process daily because it's a negative thought that will close us off, a repressed feeling closes us off. A dysfunctional action closes us off from that dynamic state. I'm calling it a vibrant state. Mm -hmm. And so it's a daily practice of processing our thoughts, feelings, speech, and actions. And there are several different ways you can do it. You can process through relaxation by Reviewing your day, and it may not have anything to do with your mate, but it could have something to do with dealing with children and yelling at them. You feel guilty because you yelled at your children or not meeting a deadline at work, and all of a sudden your body gets tight. You've closed off. And so we want to look at how to open up again. And you can do it by asking certain questions in a relaxed state, I also do a form of tapping. I don't know if you're familiar with energy psychology and EFT or emotional freedom techniques to help people release these feelings. And then you release the feelings, but also identify the belief that creates the feeling. And if we can change the belief, we change our karma. Now, when we talk about beliefs, they usually stem, regarding relationships, they usually stem from the way we lived with our parents and what we saw, what we experienced from our parents' relationship and decisions that we made about how we would live our lives. And this affects what we attract to us And usually I am trained in imago therapy, and the word imago means we're attracted to the images in our minds of our parents, and in particular, the parent with whom we still have unfinished business. And so we attract the person who might look and be totally opposite the parent we still have unresolved issues with, yet unconsciously has the same energy. And we have to work that through. Like you had said, Jesse, to meet each other's needs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I I have people do what, what was called dialoguing and really learning to listen and and mirror back what somebody's saying and then empathize, validate and empathize and then come to some switch behavior and agree to some switch behavior. And then people will say, well, why do I have to do it for her? (laughs) Why do I have to meet her needs, you know? I'm so glad you went there. Because that comes up a lot, I think, in relationships. Why do I always have to be the one making the compromise? Why am I always the one doing this? Exactly. <laughs> this is my However, soulmate doing yeah, this. Right, right. So, but the answer to that is that's what your soul needs to learn. Meaning she might say, I need more warmth and affection. And he would say, well, why do I have to change to meet them? Maybe she could meet it herself. Well, Mm -hmm. your soul needs to learn warmth and affection, or your term, compassion. And and it's (laughs) it's one of those ironies, kind of like the aspect of um, I I want this from you, I want this from you, like anything we want, I want, I want, I want, but when we learn how to give, we open up and we have everything that we wanted. <laughs> mm-hmm. So it's- that's a really good point. I worked with a couple 
recently, and she says, well, I get no affection and no sign of love, and the man automatically moved over on the sofa, put his hand around her, and she withdrew. So here he was, giving her what she wanted, but she wasn't open to receiving it. And, and this is a big thing because we oftentimes have these wants, not just in relationships but also other areas of life, but we're not really in a space to receive it. We haven't really broken through what we needed to break through to receive it. And it's interesting where you talk about drawing in a partner who has traits or characteristics or things that are similar to a parent that we have unresolved issues with. And I think this is very true. We oftentimes will will draw to a partner who who is very much like one parent or the other. And in doing this, a lot of times this automatically drops us into all these different roles, as you mentioned before, the parent-child role, instead of meeting each other on that adult-adult role. Or... Um, it drops us into victim abuser spaces a lot of times, or we 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 kind of have like a built-in excuse for things to go wrong. <laughs> yeah, or or we set it up in the way we communicate for them to act like our parent because it's a familiar energy. It's, right. it's a comfort energy. It's what we're accustomed to in childhood as to how we felt loved. And yes, when we don't receive the other person's energy, we usually don't feel worthy or deserving of it. So we have to work through when you closed off from your own value. And and I I think that that's true. And I think you talked about the tingly stuff earlier in the show. And and part of how we get to that tingly stuff, we have kind of that first initial response when we meet somebody. But we need to sort through that being just new and exciting because it's new and exciting. Or getting to that point where those tinglys come up even years after being with somebody or, or being able to rekindle those tinglys again. And, and I think there's so many people that they believe they have to have one or the other. You get the in love or you get the love. And the love isn't um, going to be exciting. The in love is going to be exciting, but you're, you're not feeling fulfilled. And before we can get that, that ultimate soulmate love, and I think so many people, they, they look out there and they're like, Where's my soulmate? How do I find my soulmate? What defines a soulmate? All these things. And they throw that term around. But a soulmate, in my opinion, is something that you create by bringing together those tinglys, which are the the in love with the love. And that's a process. And that's not something that just falls into your lap necessarily. That's something that you work to achieve. I'm so glad you brought that up because I have come to believe that the lust stage is the attraction to the parent that we have the unhealthy, unresolved issues with. And it's always, oh, what do I have to do to get him to love me? And that's where the excitement is. And is he ready yet for a commitment? I'm, I'm ready for a commitment. What about him? What do I have to do to get this? So you're always on edge, and that's where the excitement is. And, of course, research has been done where we have that lust, romantic stage, the dopamine is flying, the serotonin is raised and elevated. And then after 18 to 24 months, those chemicals start to decrease, and we go into the power struggle and the control issues, and the negative parts of who they remind us of parent-wise. And then there's either connection or separation. And so the lust stage to me is an unhealthy stage of what we're attracted to. And then if you can learn how to reach that deeper love 
And I used the word on my Facebook page of feeling whole within yourself rather than look to another person or quote-unquote soulmate to fulfill you. Then you're going to get into that needy relationship of you make me happy. Mm -hmm. And so um, I believe our work is to rectify the parts we've closed off from ourselves and ideally meet somebody who's done that same work. And uh, there's a question about the word soulmate. I believe in in some ways everybody we're in contact with has a little part of our soul in them as we do, as they do within us. And so everybody has something to teach us. If we really look at what am I learning from this or what can I teach from this? And if we're open to learning from everybody, we see that everybody's a soulmate. But I think people get into trouble sometimes searching for that ideal soulmate and not feeling complete until they have it. Mhm. Mhm. It's, it's kind ahead. of like, um, and I, I apologize for interrupting there. It's it's no, kind please. of like saying I'm going to go out and find the perfect uh, tree to put in my yard, mm-hmm. but you're not going to necessarily go out and find that perfect fifty foot pine tree and drop it in your yard. You're going to get maybe a 10 or a 20-foot pine tree and plant in your yard. <laughs> so and are you gonna... trying to say I'm not perfect? <laughs> not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just saying that, that, you know, that perfect, again, it, it, no it such doesn't thing. step in. It's created. Per, that perfection right. and what, and it's about being perfect for us. And when we look at that soulmate, I think, first of all, if we have to ask if this is the right person or if this is the person I'm meant to be with, if you're asking that question, they probably aren't. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't develop it (laughs) in that direction. But if you're asking and having that many... Hello? Yes. Hello? Yeah, we're breaking up again a little bit. I had a client, a young man, say to me, who's been dating somebody for about two years, say to me, she's so good for me, but is she right for me? And that's that comes out a lot. I thought it was a great question. It is. So what do you do with that? Okay, but that's where... As we discussed, what did he mean by, is she right for me? He said, well, I don't always have the tinglies with her. I'm not that excited, but she's so good for me. She really makes me a better person. And then I went into, well, what excites you? How do you feel those tinglies? And this goes back to what we were talking about before, With what are those tinglies? Do they come from the excitement of a new person and the lust again? Or does it come from that deep connection with the divine and using your creative flow? And so we went into that area of, hey, how open are you to love? He says, I don't know if I ever felt that love that you're talking about. And so we worked on opening to love. He had seen um, his parents had a volatile relationship of always arguing and uh, withdrawing from each other. That's what he learned about a relationship. You know, a lot of people don't understand that love or experience it. I mean, I, I even had a conversation with a rabbi who says he davens all the time, but he's never really experienced that love that I'm talking about. And I said to him, that's because you're always doing and giving and not taking the time to receive. 
And so this is what we worked on together is him being open to receiving. I said, how is it, easy is it for you to accept compliments? He said, oh, no. I said, how easy is it to you when somebody says you look great? Do you say thank you? Or you say, oh, you look great too. Indications that people find it difficult to receive. And it's, you know, we're working on him receiving this love, and he says he really is opening up more. And he really is more excited about her. And she didn't do anything different. <laughs> you know, and that's where I say love really comes from ourselves. And See? and it does. It it comes from us and it comes from within and and then it, it radiates from there. And and it's true. I think there's a lot of people out there that aren't sure how to find those tinglies or have never experienced them or things like that. But I think, too, um, being able to come back and say, well, what does excite you about this person? Is it because they're different? Is it because they're creative? Is it because they offer whatever energy it is they, they offer? And when you tune into that excitement, then you can you can take that and you can use that as a channel to move inward and go, okay, now I'm feeling excitement. And that's if you allow yourself to feel the excitement. But that receiving, and I think it's very hard for a lot of people to receive because in order to receive on any level, whether we're doing it for ourselves or receiving from somebody else, basically in all methods we're receiving from the creator or divine force of the universe or whatever term people want to use, um, it requires us to reach a very vulnerable uh, vulnerable space. <laughs> right, right. And that comes, very, to, but, but that comes back to what we said earlier, that people tend to take the, the comfortable, uh, unpleasant space versus the uncomfortable, pleasant. Right, right. I had a client who was dating somebody for about a year, year and a half, and she said um, she was moving into a house and was struggling financially, and he helped her with uh, getting a mortgage. He negotiated for it, and then he helped her set up a budget, and he helped her move. And she said, that week where he was so involved with her, and after they she signed the um, deed to the house, they made love, and she said, it's the first time I allowed him to really love me. And the next word is, and now I'm vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Mhm. And vulnerability is a very important word in relationships because we think if we open to allow somebody in, now they can hurt us. And I believe nobody can hurt us. At least they don't do it intentionally, but mm-hmm. we hurt ourselves by what we say to ourselves. And if we can process it and then discuss what the issue is, we're never vulnerable. I mean, vulnerability is about not taking responsibility for our thoughts, feelings, and actions. And and that's a key point right there because especially with people who are so desperate to be in a relationship, and and they say, well, I always get hurt in relationships, or this always happens in relationships. I get vulnerable, I put myself out there, and then that always happens. And really, what they've overlooked and the piece that they've skipped over in describing all of that <laughs> is that they didn't hold to their boundaries in the first place to say, I saw abusive patterns in this person, or I saw 
signs of anger or I saw the alcoholism or I saw whatever it is, but I didn't stop it at the beginning. I I made excuses for it. I, I, you know, did these different things and I allowed it to go on. So then when they get to that point and they're being vulnerable because the relationship has gone on for a certain period of time, then then they're setting themselves up to be hurt. So like you said, if they are taking these other actions to start with, vulnerability isn't a scary place. It's a place of euphoria, I would think. Well, yeah. You know, Brene Brown, I don't know if you've seen any of her TED YouTubes, but she's done a lot of research on vulnerability. And... She uses it in a positive way that we have to make ourselves vulnerable in order to be close to people. But using it in that perspective, to me, vulnerability is allowing ourselves to feel our feelings and be with them and process them. And I believe a lot of people think their feelings rather than feel them. And when we think our feelings, we act them out rather than feel and respond appropriately. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I would never have been able to remarry had I not learned this process of opening to that divine love because I really believe we're the ones who create the way we feel. It has nothing to do with other people. Other people may act out, they may do things that do hurt us, but one person can do something and the the uh, partner could say, well, screw you, I don't care, while another partner would just be crushed under that. And so right. if we can learn to process our thoughts and our feelings and open up to that love, we're never in a vulnerable state. We can always be happy. And, and and I don't want to negate the idea of discussing it with another person and setting boundaries. It's not always being in this euphoric state and letting everything go. Like you just said, we have to learn to speak up and make requests and get our needs met. Mm-hmm. However, if we process these charges, the right words come out at the right time, and I don't even have to teach communication techniques. Yes. Yes. And and I think think there is a lot of communication things we need to learn, and I think usually couples are trying to get to the same place. They, They both want to have that amazing experience where it's all coming together, but we've got to learn to, to speak each other's language. We've got to learn what women need to learn what guy talk is, and guy talk, guys need to learn what women's talk is. <laughs> and, well, <laughs> very funny. One time I did a workshop for men only, and it was the first time I was doing it. And I said, look, guys, I'm going to be really honest with you. This is the first time I'm doing this for men only. Uh, about marital strife to intimacy. And I said, I'm he- I, us women know what you guys want. I'm here to educate you on what women want. So one of these guys snidely said, what do they want? I said, they want to be understood. They want their feelings heard and empathized with. And he said, I thought that's what they have girlfriends for. Mm. Mm. Wow. Does that say it all? That that's a huge statement right there. That's a huge statement and and that sense of feeling like, you know, here again, that's not my responsibility, but I think again some of those reactions come out because of of some of these aspects men do tend to operate a little more practically in things. And it's about there's a need, you take care of it. <laughs> exactly. It's your need, exactly. you take care and of here, it. I'm going to tell you how. 
So it's it's an important thing. So now, Penny, one of the things I want to touch on here is how do we get to opening to love? You've you've talked all night about opening to love. We need to to open to love, and that's how we get into these spaces, be it vulnerability, being able to expand the relationship, keeping something lasting, and, and, and we need to be in that space, obviously, before we take things to the next level and make more serious commitments. Mm-hmm. So how do people get to that space? Would you mind if I did a little um, meditation? I, I would love it. I, I've got about 15 to 20 minutes for you to work with. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> the paradox. Hurry up and meditate. <laughs> Hurry up and meditate. <laughs> Can we do it in that amount of time? Yes, yes. 20 minutes? I'll shorten it a little bit, but you'll get the idea. Ideally, a good meditation is 20 minutes because it takes that amount of time for the um, uh, nervous system to relax. Okay. So, However, I'll do it, you know, yeah. So what I suggest is closing your eyes. And just get into a very comfortable place, keeping your back straight but not tight. And just set the intention to relax totally, but to stay very aware and alert. And now focus all your attention on your head, eyes, the muscles behind your eyes, your eyelids and the muscles in your eyelids, and just imagine being free of muscular tension. And now focus on your nose, cheeks, temples, jaw, Lips, chin, neck, and again, imagine being free of muscular tension. And now focus on the top of your spine, shoulders, chest, heart, lungs, rib cage, the middle of your spine lower part of your spine, stomach and waist, and again, imagine being free of muscular tension. And now focus on your buttocks, genital area, thighs, knees, calves, ankles, feet, and again, imagine being free of muscular tension. And now just think of letting go of all your thoughts and feelings like two streams of light pouring out of you into a treasury box on the table. And now just imagine grounding yourself with the nutrients of the earth. And imagine earth energy coming up into your feet Ankles, calves, knees, draw it up into your thighs, buttocks, genital area. Bring it up into your rib cage, lungs, heart, chest. Just draw up those nutrients from the earth. Now bring it up even further into your neck, face, head, and now imagine a brilliant light 
above your head, radiating a channel of light around your entire body, engulfing you like a blanket of warmth. And just notice what you're experiencing. It might be a tingly sensation on your skin or a change of temperature. Just notice when you're surrounded in a bubble of light, warmth, radiance. Now imagine that light coming into your head. And you can imagine it through seeing it, feeling it, sensing it. Allow yourself to feel the warmth of light like sunlight literally coming into your head. And now expanding down into your neck, shoulders, arms. And now imagine it expanding into your chest, lungs, and heart. And you can even rate your level of openness on a scale of 0 to 10, with 10 being the highest. Ask yourself, how open is my heart? Some people are resistant to opening. They might feel some kind of a um, block, not allowing that light to come down. Some people might see a box, a color gray, dark. Allow that light and love to come in. You can always close off later if you want, but imagine that light and love coming into your heart. And by rating that level of openness, you'll know what you need to work on. And now imagine that light even expanding down into your stomach and down into your feet. And now imagine sending that light to your loved one while you're constantly receiving from your divine self in a circle of light, love, receiving, and giving. And notice what you're experiencing. Notice if you're open to receiving the love and sharing the love. Notice what's going on in skin sensations as well as internally as you receive and give. And now you can stay in this state as long as you like. And whenever you're ready, give thanks 
for any insights, any sensations, any experiences. And then open your eyes. Wow. That's, um, I really want to say thank you for that. Um, and, and I'd be happy to hear from anybody whether they want to call in and, and share what they've experienced during this or whether they want to type in through chat um, what they, they were getting or picking up during this. Either way, it would be great to hear some responses on this. Um, it's really a powerful meditation that you've provided there for us tonight, Penny. And I think it's, for me, I know I could even feel like I, as, as you were talking about different things, and, and I could feel where I'm blocked for maybe receiving some things and, um, and where the energy flowed very freely as well. Mm-hmm. And... And I think this is one of those things that even if you've worked very, very hard and you've done a lot of opening, something that is as simple as this, and this only took you about 10 minutes. <laughs> right. I was good. <laughs> so even in a matter of 10 minutes, how much you can really start to relax and open to that space. And I think what could be really powerful for people when they're looking at being in a relationship is if you could take and do this exercise, for example, before going and seeing that partner or before sitting down and spending time. Like if you came home from work and you did this exercise before you sat down and spent time with your partner or if you're dating somebody and you're not living together, that you did this before you you went and saw them. I think one of the things that people would find is they would be a lot clearer and a lot more accepting and a lot more able to receive the things that they're hoping to find with somebody. And and I think that's a powerful place because not only are we more open to that receiving, but also it puts us in a space where we're calm and we're centered and we're focused in a way that we know we can we can see much more clearly. I guess that's what I'm saying is we can see much more clearly what's happening and what is working or not working for us. Right, it's seeing what's going on inside us. That means and when we're clearer. doing that, we see what's happening in the relationship much clearer. Exactly. Absolutely wonderful. So this is a this is a big thing and I think that this is a great way of how people can deal with their fears that arise along the way. Um mm-hmm. suspicions and and finding the space of vulnerability, finding a way to step into this love like we just did tonight a lot of those suspicions go away because what it does is it brings us into that higher self which allows us then to look at things with a clear mind and instead of saying, oh my God, he must be sleeping with somebody because he didn't call me tonight. (laughs) Wow, I hope he didn't have a, you know, too long of a day at work or I hope he didn't have to be caught at work until 8 p.m. And it's totally exhausted. So it shifts us because we're coming from that different place. The stories we make up. Oh, we make up tons of them. Exactly. And when we're in that space, that's a good cue that we need to stop and do something like this. Right. Now that's just the introductory practice. Oh, my goodness. Once you're in that state of openness, 
That's when if you review your day or if you review a transaction, you'll see where there's constriction in your body. You'll be able to experience it and feel it. And when we can identify feelings in the trunk of the body, before I mention most people uh, think they're feelings rather than feel them, uh, somebody might come to me and say, oh, my God, I'm so sad. My husband told me he wants a divorce. I've been crying for two weeks straight. And I would say, well, are you letting yourself feel the sadness? She says, what do you mean? I've been screaming. I've been crying. I said, where do you where do you experience that in your body? She said, in my head. I said, well, let's bring that energy down into the trunk of your body and see where you feel it now. And with sadness, there's a good chance you'll feel constriction in the heart area. Mm-hmm then you're feeling the vibration in your body rather than just thinking it. And then I go through a process with people of how to feel the feeling, identify what the belief is that's creating the feeling or the story we're telling ourselves, referencing what you just said, and learning how to transform them, how to see the truth of what's going on. And that's when we open to love again. And then we ask ourselves internally, I call this um, intuitive inspiration, asking our body, how can I deal with this differently in the future or better? So it's seeing things through the eyes of love. And this is how we literally retrain ourselves to respond rather than react in a similar situation. Mm -hmm. And that literally changes the way people treat us and our karma. Absolutely. And it's it's a big, big part of it when we change how we're looking at other people and we look at them through those eyes of love, they're going to look at us through those same eyes. Eyes, exactly. That's what we start with tonight of like attracts like. Right, exactly. Penny, I really want to thank you for being here tonight and for giving your time and your energy and sharing this simple step with us. Uh, again, if anybody would like to connect with Penny, she has her website at www.pennycohen.com, and that's uh, right there at the bottom of the show description. You can link right on. She has workshops that are going on. You can work with her um, and, and contact her. She also authored Personal Kabbalah. Um, She's given some great tips tonight, some great insights tonight on how we can open to love, how we can prepare ourselves for being in that relationship that we want, and how we can bring together both love and being in love. Penny, is there anything that you want to leave us with or wrap up with here in the next two minutes? Two minutes. How fast can I read ten principles? Try it. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Although a good relationship does have something to do with what you think about the other person, it has more to do with how you feel about yourself when you're with that person. Number two, although a good relationship does have something to do with how well you get along, it has more to do with how well you can handle each other's garbage. Although a good relationship has good communication skills, more importantly, it's how quickly and thoroughly you get over the disagreements and forgive something we didn't mention tonight. Forgive yourself and your partner. Although a good relationship does include arguments, it's arguing from love, not revenge. Five, a good relationship is one where you can laugh at your own idiosyncrasies enjoy each other's company, and make love and light of life. 
Six, a good relationship is when you realize love is self-imposed. Seven, a good relationship involves self-love, the love that comes from your higher self when you're open to receiving. Eight, self-love is the love that emerges when you free yourself of judgments, criticisms, expectations, blame and shame, and are totally in the present and open. Number nine, being in love is when you allow yourselves to receive each other's energies and the two souls merge. Ten, being in love is learning how to just be and feel worthy and deserving of receiving love. And being in love is blissful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's been My such a, pleasure. It's been such a gift, and there you go. Ten amazing tips there for keeping your relationship going and how to make it not only be a part of your life, but to thrive. And um, Penny, we just greatly appreciate having you here tonight. Again, you can reach Penny uh, through her website at www.pennycohen.com. And I just want to remind some everybody here that next week I've got on Rob and Alex Janelle. Uh, they are going to be sharing with us how to turn up the heat in our relationships and how to keep things spicy and exciting and passionate. And they will be looking at creating a tantric connection with your partner so that you can know how to keep falling in love with someone over and over and over again. Um, so this is actually going to be an extension on what Penny shared with us tonight. And um, again, the Compassion Tour, you can follow up with that at jessieandnicholsgeorge.eventbrite.com. All of my contact information, if you'd like to reach me, is there at the bottom of the show description as well. So you can always email me. And I want to mention, too, as a listener, either live or in the archives of Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour, I am offering 50% off of half-day and full-day coaching sessions and um, alignment sessions for couples. You can send me an email at lifeofbliss at q.com to get more information on this. And all you need to do is contact me by February 14th to set up an appointment time. Okay, you don't have to have the session by then, but you do need to contact me by then to take advantage of it. Uh, in addition to that, because I really want to help you get going with things that you're working on this year, if you send me an email, again, to lifeofbliss at q.com, um, you're welcome to pick up a free copy of my ebooks, which are um, Activating Compassion and Activating Compassion, the workbook. You just have to email me. That's all there is to it. And then I also need to remind you that we've got several shows now here on Main Street Universe going on throughout the week. As you know, Activating Compassion right here on Friday nights. On uh, Sunday nights, we now have Darren Bouquer. He's sharing his gift of psychic readings with us. That's followed up Monday nights with Kevin Baird, who does Walking on the Sidewalk. He works with his Horizon Oracle Journeys cards. And if you haven't had a reading by, uh, care, um, by Kevin, he does a really amazing job. And the Horizon Oracle Journeys is really a different kind of deck to work with and it's a different perspective on things. So very, very valuable. Jump into his show as well. On Tuesday nights, we have a new hostess coming in, and that is Mary Phelan. She's going to be doing a show called Inner Wisdom, and Mary has a, an incredible background to offer. So if you're liking my show, I think also you're going to want to listen to Mary's because she's going to be having similar types of things happening or similar um, area of interest and focus uh, as I'm having here. And then, of course, Wednesday nights is our flagship show, Main Street Universe, and we've got Daniel and Janice on those nights. So lots of great shows. This is Jesse Ann Nichols George. I want to thank you so much for being here tonight. I look forward to seeing you back here next week as we delve into Activating Compassion. And don't forget that if you've enjoyed this show this evening, 
to share it with others. It will be available at the same link in our archives. And um, I'm going to leave you tonight with the song Yearning For by Shem Shai. It's also known as Over and Over. And I want to thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you back here again next week right here on Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour. May you enjoy the rest of your weekend and have an amazing week. And if I could see what makes me blind, I would soar to the edge of my mind. And to touch what seems unreal, just to show you the way that I feel. And we are in time with time, one with season of change inside. And we are in tune with the tune, caught in a balance of sun and moon.
Your face. 